the election takes place, there's a mixed result uh, or, 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 or a mixed response to the results of the election because the NDP have this enormous breakthrough in Quebec. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the Conservatives have a majority. And um, people quickly forget, I think, the puzzling um, results of the election given the fact that the polls didn't predict anything like the outcome that arrived. Uh, but months pass, and um, it, it isn't until February of the next year that a, a story appears in post media to fairly determined and intrepid reporters of all things in post media, Steve Marr and Glenn McGregor, uh, publish an account of the fact that in the preceding November, in November 2011, documents were filed with a court in Edmonton, Alberta, seeking production of records from a company named Rack 9. And the sworn documents or affidavits that were placed before the court by the investigating officer from Elections Canada related uh, an account of voter suppression that had taken place in Guelph, Ontario, in which people received on the Saturday morning before the election, uh, calls misdirecting them to the wrong polling station. Uh, there were over 7,000 of those calls. And so we learned for the first time, this is 10 months after the election takes place, that somebody tried to uh, steal the democratic franchise uh, of Canadians, at least in the riding of Guelph, Ontario. But what happened next was that there was an outpouring of evidence and complaints to Elections Canada that people had experienced similar events right across the country, that they had received calls that were deliberately intended, uh, it appears, to discourage them from voting or to discourage them from voting for their, from, for their preferred candidates. And the two techniques that were used were either to phone people and tell them that their polling station had changed to some remote location that would, uh, you know, if they actually uh, got on a bus or drove across town in order to vote at that station, they would find out they weren't indeed registered to vote there, or they would get calls in the middle of the night purporting to be on behalf of the candidate they favored, an NDP candidate or a Liberal candidate, which were clearly intended to harass them and discourage their support for the very candidate they might have favored. Um, and so that, um, that is uh, what we begin to discover uh, about the election of 2011, uh, 10 and 11 months later. There are 30,000 complaints that are filed with Elections Canada in the few weeks following the revelations of February 22nd. And of those 30,000 complaints, 700 at the time alleged specific incidents of voter suppression that people um, who are making the complaints kind of relate uh, of events that happened uh, during that election. Now, um, I want to give you a little um, uh, course in, in law because um, in part I think, you know, the stuff is very accessible. You don't have to be a lawyer to kind of get it. Um, if you look at the next slide, so that is, um, a provision of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it guarantees every Canadian the right to vote. There it is in black and white. It's easy to, to understand. It's a fundamental uh, right uh, of, of, of citizenship. It is the first building block of a democratic society. There's another, there's another provision of the Charter, which is very pertinent to Alan Gregg's comments, which is Section 2B, which is the right of free speech, and um, just, as an, just as an aside, this Harper attack on science and evidence-based decision-making is arguably a breach of that charter right. Not the rights of scientists to speak, because you've all seen stories about the government muzzling uh, scientists and abandoning science, but of the right of the rest of us to exercise free speech, which assumes that we're informed that, that we have the benefit of evidence about the circumstances in the world around us from the, from, from the census to the environmental lakes area so that we can exercise in some meaningful way our right of free speech, just as an aside. Back to um, Section 3 of the Charter, which guarantees you the right to vote. Section 524 of the, Can of the Canada Elections Act, that empowers any person eligible to vote 
in an election with the right to go to court to enforce their right to vote if in some manner it has been taken from them. If they've been um, the victim of some attempt to defraud uh, or engage in an illicit practice which has somehow infringed your right to vote. So you have the right to vote under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and then you have uh, the right to enforce that right to vote if you believe that something untoward has happened in an election that's deprived you of it. This is the authority that a court has to actually annul the results of an election if um, the court is persuaded that in fact uh, an individual's democratic franchise has been um, uh, removed from them by virtue of deceit or a corrupt or fraudulent practice. And it is this provision uh, and the preceding one, 524, which we invoked uh, in order to challenge the outcome of the election in seven ridings across Canada. And by we, I mean uh, electors in those ridings uh, who experienced voter suppression uh, during the May 11th election and took advantage of their right under the law to go to court to get a judicial ruling that would annul the results of the election uh, in their writings because of the fraudulent practices that they believed uh, had taken place during the May um, 2011 election. Um, now, their cases are being supported by the Council of Canadians. It's extremely expensive and difficult to litigate these issues. Uh, they're utterly beyond the capacity of, uh, of, of, of most of us. You'd have to be extremely wealthy as an individual to take up your rights uh, under the law in Canada. Uh, and so uh, it was, it's with the benefit of the Council of Canadians and its fundraising campaign. It doesn't have a budget for this. Uh, but it's gone out to Canadians and it's gone out to the labor movement and it's raised uh, quite a bit of money in order to support the costs of, of litigation. Um, in support of the applications that were brought, we hired Frank Graves, who is the principal at ECOS Research. And um, he conducted a survey of um, uh, electors in the seven ridings we were contesting, 5,000 electors in each of those ridings, and then to test the results that we were getting from um, uh, people in those ridings when we asked them or when they were asked, well, you know, did you get a call indicating that the location of your polling station had changed? Did that affect uh, or did you not vote as a result? He also did a, a, a survey of people in comparison groups, many of them in Alberta, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, where we didn't think there was voter suppression activity during the 2011 election because when, when the survey was undertaken, uh, there weren't a lot of reports of voter suppression activity in certain parts of the country. So we wanted to kind of compare the two. So in that table 3.1, what you see is the response of people um, in the subject writings, which were the ones we were contesting, was far higher than the response of people in the comparison writings. Now, we subsequently found out that people in the comparison writings were also getting these calls. Um, and so, uh, in a way, we satisfied our uh, principal objective, which was to demonstrate that there was targeting of these particular writings, uh, uh, because there's a clearly statistically significant difference between the way in which people responded to these questions, depending on whether they were in the target writings or in the comparison group. But that comparison group number is very significantly high. And it turns out, uh, for reasons I can't get into, and in, in, in given the time constraints this morning, there were calls right across the country, including to electors in Alberta. The next slide is more telling. It, it demonstrates that the calls were targeted at Liberals, NDP, and Green Party supporters. So if you look at, I, I hope you can see the, the lines there, but if you look at the third uh, you know, set of bar charts, you see the NDP and then the Liberal and the Green Parties, you see that 28% of the people responding to the survey who were NDP supporters, for example, uh, indicated that they got a call indicating that their polling station had changed. Now, you should know that there were no polling station changes in six of these seven ridings. So there's no reason for anybody to get a call from anybody about a polling station change. But what's interesting about the response of the NDP, you see that at 28.1%? 
and then the Liberal Party is 37.3. Compare that to the Tories. They're down at 11. So you see a sharp difference between the way in which uh, people respond depending on whether they're members of, uh, whether they support the Conservative Party or not. It clearly demonstrates a targeting of non-Conservative Party supporters. This is the evidence that whoever carried this out was carrying it out on behalf of the Conservatives uh, and were targeting. Uh, non-conservative party supporters and trying to discourage them from exercising their democratic franchise. The other thing that's interesting about this chart, I hope I'm not getting too wonkish about this, is that if you look at the Liberal Party response, for example, 37.3, um, the, the next number on, in light blue is the response of Liberals in the comparison group. So one of the criticisms of these numbers might be, well, when you canvass Liberals, they're going to be disgruntled, or NDPers, they're going to be disgruntled about the results of the election. So they're going to report receiving one of these calls even though they didn't receive one of these calls. Well, if that was true, you wouldn't see these stark differences between the way in which liberals responded depending on whether they were living in the target ridings or the comparison group. Right? Understand? So it clearly demonstrates targeting and that uh, there was a deliberate campaign to suppress the vote of non-conservative voters. We then went on to ask, and this gets a little more complicated, but well, well, did this cause you not to vote? And the numbers that are significant in this chart really are the numbers that are in the uh, right column. Um, because uh, Frank Graves' overall estimate, considering uh, this chart and a number of others which pull together responses to questions that were also designed to test the impact of these voter suppression techniques on, on electors. Um, you know, he arrived at the conclusion that somewhere between one and a half and two percent uh, of eligible electors um, were, were discouraged from voting as a result. Of, of, uh, of receiving a voter suppression call. So that's somewhere between six, seven hundred, fifteen hundred, depending on the size of the riding electors in, 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 these, uh, in the particular ridings that were targeted. Well, the margins in our ridings range from uh, dozens of electors to hundreds of electors. The results of the election in, uh, of our seven ridings, I think in five or six, would flip, um, given that uh, the effectiveness of, of, of a regime that, that discouraged one and a half percent of the people from actually turning out to the polls. Um, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to um, um, give you a little taste of what it was like litig against, litigating against the Tories. They retained their uh, arch um, legal counsel, a guy named Arthur Hamilton. Uh, they came running at us with one attack after the other, doing their best to prevent the case from even being heard by the judge. They attacked, um, they attacked Maud Barlow as being a wanton and officious intermeddler. Um, she had a button uh, printed up, I think, I think boats boasting about the fact that she was an officious intermeddler. Uh, they went after me personally. Uh, they just described this as a vendetta against the Conservative Party. They, gave, they brought a motion to have the case dismissed as frivolous and vexatious. They lost that motion and had to pay our costs. The next motion they brought was for an order for us to post a bond for security for costs in their favor for a quarter of a million dollars, which would have knocked the litigation back if it, what, it might have even uh, prevented it from proceeding. Um, they lost that, and they had to pay our costs. They went after um, they went after us for something called champerty and maintenance, um, which was the notion that um, that uh, really this wasn't the these weren't the applications of the individual electors, but really the application of the Council of Canadians. That's still before the judge. We argued the cases in December. I thought we might have had a decision this week for me to relate to you. There may be one next week. The judge has to make three determinations. Was there fraud? Did it affect the result of the election? Which legally means was one single voter deterred from voting as a result of the voter suppression that took place? And three, uh, Given all of that, should I exercise my discretion as a judge and annul the results of the election? So watch for the decision that's coming soon. 
even if we don't succeed in persuading the judge to annul the result of the election, I have some hope that we, will, we have persuaded him that fraud took place during the election. I, the evidence is quite overwhelming and compelling. That would be a startling finding. The Tories will spin uh, the case as a victory for them uh, if results aren't annulled. But a finding that somebody engaged in a deliberate campaign to defraud Canadian electors is a startling conclusion for a court to uh, arrive at and one that uh, needs to be taken extremely seriously. Um, there will probably be an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's a very expedited process and we'll probably get a decision by the Supreme Court um, uh, probably within the year. Um, I just want to um, give you a little bit more of a flavor of what it was like to litigant, litigate against it. Here's one of the letters that I get in, in the week before the hearing when I'm about to, f I've, I've brought a motion to introduce uh, a bit of a gloss on Frank Gray's evidence, and I get this threat at five o'clock in the afternoon, and it says, you know, your motion is completely frivolous. If you don't agree to withdraw it and abandon the motion by 6 p.m. today, I think I had an hour and a half to do that, according to these guys, we'll be seeking costs against you personally, payable on a solicitor and client basis in addition to other remedies related to dismissal of the motion. So this was like typical, and they would serve me at 11 o'clock at night, so I composed this response. I have enjoyed the time since receiving your ultimatum more than I could have imagined. <laughs> and, and would like if, I would like, if at all possible, to prolong the experience. <laughs> would you then, as a courtesy, consider extending the deadline to 7 p.m., so that I could savor the next 60 minutes, just as I have the past 60 minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up. The, you need two things to pull off voter suppression in a riding. You need $162.10. That was the cost, that was what Rack 9 charged Pierre Poutine. Now, we know Michael Sona just got charged. Uh, for having committed that offense. $162.10, 7,000 calls for that price, that's what modern technology delivers, and you need a list. You need a list of non-conservative party supporters. You can't get that on the internet. That's the list, it's called the, the, the uh, Constituency Information Management System, it's the brainchild of Tom Flanagan. That's where the information to carry out voter suppression came from. Uh, political parties, and in this case, the Conservative Party, has to be held to account for the use and misuse of that information. So we'll see what the court uh, has to say about that. Uh, one last thing. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to tell you about the cases. Um, I, I mean, in all of the assaults that he's launched, this is, has to be considered the most serious. Thank you.